Okay. We are live. So welcome everybody to episode 30 of the Volatility Barometer. Thank you very much for joining me. I know it's Christmas. I know people have a lot to do, but uh, thank you very much for spending a few minutes here. I really do appreciate it. So um, notice I got my Christmas lights set up here. I'm in my hotel room. I'm actually flying tomorrow, so uh, that'll be interesting, flying on Christmas Day. I had a choice between, you know, the 23rd to the 27th, and I actually chose Christmas Day. I'm just curious what airports are like on the 25th. So I'll be in Panama the next time we do these live streams. Um, staying there for about a month, maybe three and a half weeks. And then from there, I'm going to Dubai, which will be interesting. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. And then hopefully at some point, I will get myself back into Taiwan. So it's been 13, 14 months now. I've been locked out of the country. Um, they're very strict, closed to foreigners. And so uh, hopefully this is the one. Hopefully in a couple of months, I will actually end up there. So um, I'll just share the quick rundown today. I do think the Q&A is, of course, the most important. So I'll leave plenty of time there. We'll get to all your questions about UVXY and crazy markets and whatnot. But I do want to also do a couple of segments. I'm going to answer somebody's question. They specifically asked me about trying to actually quantify how much more volatile markets are these days compared to, you know, say previous decades before. So I've got a few numbers there. I think people probably, you know, I'll explain why it feels like things are more volatile recently. And then the next segment, Lessons from the Links. I am a former pro golfer, so there are a few lessons that I've learned in my former pro career that I think do translate pretty well over into just life and trading and, and whatnot. So I'll share a little bit of a story there. And then, of course, open Q&A. Ask me anything you want. Uh, we will do a completely off-topic Q&A again in Panama. I'll get a bottle of wine and I'll answer all the awkward questions. But uh, yeah, feel free to ask me anything you want. But without further ado, Merry Christmas. And let's get into a brief intro and then we'll start. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I really do appreciate the support. So my name's Brent Osachoff. I'm a Canadian and I'm a former professional golfer. So you will hear the odd golf analogy slipped in there from time to time. I run, I love movies, diehard UFC fan, and I do love to travel. So you'll see this background change throughout the year. So just give me one minute here to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you do feel like you need a little more structure in your investing, I do also manage a private investing community with members from over 65 countries around the world. And it's all centered around both of our diversified portfolios. You can choose the one that best suits your personal level of risk tolerance. There's a daily email sent out every morning with a ton of very useful volatility metrics at the top, which you can learn more about each one of them and start applying them to your own trading. There's a daily article or video where I break down some of the most requested topics from members. And then most importantly, of course, in every email, every day, I state exactly what position each of my strategies will be in, along with all the allocation sizing and risk management that goes with them. I've made it easy to follow so you can get the same consistent performance the VTS community has enjoyed for over nine years now. No obligation, but if this is something you may be interested in, go to volatilitytradingstrategies.com, click the subscribe tab, and the monthly subscription does come with a free two-week trial so you can check it all out before committing. Thanks again for supporting the YouTube channel and spending a little bit of time with me here today. So let's get on with the show. Okay, so let's get on with the first question, and I will just go ahead and show you what that email stated. I would imagine it's a question that uh, some of you are wondering yourself. So he says, I've been investing for about 20 years, mostly buy and hold. Sorry. You don't have to be sorry about that, by the way. I mean, people have to invest the way that makes the most sense to them. I'm certainly not going to attack this person for being a buy and hold investor, but it's just a personal thing for me. Of, of course, as we understand the markets, we know that buy and hold will come with it some pretty excruciating drawdowns and long-term performance is going to be pretty minimal. Um, maybe I could just take a 20 second little detour and go over that with people, why, why I would say something like that. Um, annualized S&P 500 return calculator. We're not going to cherry pick anything. Of course, it's a terrible starting period or ending period to be at all time highs in the market, right? December, 2021. But you can see here that even just completely random 20 year period, 
the S&P has not actually returned a whole lot. Uh, 6.9 if you reinvest dividends. But of course, the buy and hold investor is also going to have bonds and treasuries and precious metals and real estate and all these other things as well that are significantly below this. So my whole point is that buy and hold investing, while it might sound good in a bull market, long term, you're probably looking at a very low single digit rate of return. So um, let's keep that in mind. But moving on, it is completely fine if you're buy and hold. Hopefully, if you watch a few of my videos, you might change your mind. But let's continue. So he says, I have a question and it maybe is just an observation. Is it just me or are markets much more volatile after the financial crisis? It seems up or down 2% days are way more common than I remember from before. So this is a long-term investor who has a memory of, you know, going back 20 years. Do I have any data on this? So it's it's not the easiest thing in the world to nail down, but we can look at a few things. So one thing that I have done, let me just check if I'm on screen share. Good. Would hate to make that mistake five minutes into the stream. But what I've done here, we've got all the data from the S&P 500 going back to 1990. And all I'm really doing is filtering out for the days that have larger moves, right? So the 10th percentile move, which is, you know, one in 10, 10% of the time, the S&P 500 drops minus 1.14% or more. That's a 10th percentile move. And then I just organized it in thirds going back to 1990. So the first period would include, you know, the dot-com bust, the leading up in the 90s, and then the dot-com bust. The second period would be the financial crisis. And then the third period, I guess the biggest scare we had was would be the pandemic. And we can see if we divide it up by thirds, as far as 10th percentile moves, it is that second period that saw significantly more larger days. And not overly surprising, right? If we look, the orange lines here are overlaying all of those 10th percentile moves of S&P crashing more than 1.14%. And you can see they're fairly concentrated around crisis. Now, no doubt, I believe anyway, I don't know where you stand on this, but I believe if the Fed and the government didn't take the extraordinary measures that they did, this crash in the pandemic might have looked a lot more like these two here, where it may have lasted four or five years. But of course, we didn't want to pay the price this time around. So kick the can down the road. I would imagine at some point we're going to see a massive concentration of these orange lines. But as it stands, just statistically, actually, no, the S&P 500 isn't as volatile as it was in previous years. This one here is a fifth percentile move. So one in 20, and that's minus 1.71. And again, here, the majority of those big moves are again concentrated around the middle point. You can actually see it a little better here. This is just filtering out for the fifth percentile moves. And again, I can't say that we skated through clean here. I think we're going to pay the price eventually. But you can see quite clearly that, no, um, the S&P is not as volatile now as it was before. And then the third period, first percentile moves, if you want to know what that number is, crashing more than 3.11% in a single day. Again, no surprise, financial crisis is where we're seeing all those occurrences. Not a whole lot recently. It takes quite a bit to get the S&P moving 3.11%, but there you have it. But in fairness to the person asking the question, from a volatility perspective, let's go through the same analysis and let's see if the same is actually true for the VIX index. So now we've got the VIX index values going back to 1986. When I normalized all of this, I did use the same period starting in 1990. So all the numbers, they don't start at 86. I just like to have the first four years. I use the VXO calculation with the S&P 100, just so we can include things like Black Monday, 1987, and we can see a little further back. But you can see here, it's actually different. If we filter out for the 90th percentile move, a VIX spike of greater than 7.35%, we can see that actually there have been more, even though the pandemic was recovered extremely quickly, we still see far more volatility spikes in the most recent third going back to 1990. Fifth percentile move, basically 95th percentile greater than an 11.04% spike on the VIX, again, we've seen a larger concentration of those spikes. So you can start to get the picture here. First percent, 99th percentile moves, greater than 22.71% on the VIX. Again, nearly double the uh, financial crisis and, and obviously far more than the dot-com bust. And we can see those occurrences here. You can sort of eyeball it. You can see that, yeah, it's getting a little bit darker orange over here 
This is not an exact science. We're using the eyeball test here. But statistically, it is very true that volatility is spiking more often and more violently in the last 10 years than it was in the previous 30 years, essentially. And we can see that here. So again, who knows what would have happened if they didn't swoop in and spend what amounts to, what, six, seven, eight trillion dollars in, in stimulus, just an obscene amount of money spent. But yes, we can say that quite definitively, it's actually, from a volatility perspective, it's pretty clear that the markets are spiking more. So another way we can view this is now that we know that the largest spikes are happening more recently, we can also see this is the 25 largest VIX spike since 1990. So we are now going back 31 years. And 10 of the 25 were post-2018 Volpocalypse. So if you had the feeling, like many investors out there do, that the last three or four years has been you know, full of whipsaw and, and reversals and large volatility spikes, you would be correct. That is exactly what we are seeing. Not only the last 31 years, but the last four is, at this point, getting pretty close to half the occurrences. So that is interesting, that not only is the last 10 years more volatile than the previous 25, but even within the last 10 years, it's actually the last three or four that are showing the most instances. Here's the largest one-day VXX spikes, volatility ETP VXX, tracking the VIX futures. 19 of the largest 30 going back to the launch of VIX futures in 2004, so we've got 17 years of data, 19 of the 30 are just the last three years and you know nearly four years now since February 5th, 2018. So yes, absolutely no question at all. Volatility is getting extremely elevated and we're seeing just basically a nonstop stream of this. So there, I think the reason people ask these questions, sort of implicit in asking questions sometimes is, you know, is this going to last forever? Is this basically the market that we have? And what, I mean, I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball, but what I would say is that markets do ebb and flow. And there are periods that show extremely elevated volatility for short periods of time. And then investors get used to that and then the market will change. It's not something that I personally feel is just gonna last forever and something we just get used to. There's actually a pretty decent historical example. Not many people are aware of this. They don't track numbers going back very far. But if you look at this chart, this is the VIX index annual mean since 1990. Now, right now, this year, this is updated as of last week, we can see that this year we are averaging basically dead on the long-term mean. But if we look at 97 to 2000, you can imagine that the people who were trading back then, and I wasn't one of them, I wasn't trading in 1998, but, and I would imagine very few people are, but if you were, you might have had the exact same impression. Well, wow, this volatile markets, the VIX is averaging in the low to mid 20s, and yet the S&P 500 was marching higher. This is the tail end three years of the dot-com bust. Markets were doing very well at that period. But again, we've got a volatility readings of significantly higher than average. It should be down here, right, technically. But remember, the VIX is a plus minus. It doesn't necessarily invert to the S&P. It can also move in tandem with the S&P. Volatility is volatility. It counts in both directions. So the markets are raging higher. And these people back then probably thought that, wow, the markets have changed forever. Clearly, volatility is here to stay. And what, what do we find? Well, no, that's not actually the case. We can see that the VIX did at some point start to get to depressed levels, go a few years, four or five years where volatility is low and that is the norm, and then you'll ebb and flow into a new market cycle. So the question is valid, volatility is elevated, we are seeing major spikes, but at some point we are going to start seeing normal volatility readings. So what this last one is showing is the VIX mode. Now for anybody who doesn't know, Mode is a way of, you essentially organize the data in a sequence. The mode is the number that occurs most frequently. So when you're talking about the VIX, you're numbering the VIX from a low in the nines to a high as 82.69. The mode, the most common occurring number divided into single handles, like a 12, 13 handle, is actually a 12 handle. The VIX spends more time with a 12 handle than any other number in the sequence, followed by 13, then 14, then 11. So the VIX actually, while the long-term mean is 19.49,
That's because the high-end values of 82 are pulling up the average, but the VIX actually does like to spend an awful lot of its time from 11 to 14. Well, have we seen any of that recently? I mean, almost none. We haven't seen, this is the VIX index for five years. The VIX hasn't closed below 15 even once since before the pandemic. So the most common occurring numbers are 11 to 14. We have not seen the VIX close below 15 even once. The lowest close was 1501. And then before that, it's not like it was, you know, dragging the bottom of the 12s or anything. Going back to the Volpocalypse, it was getting to the 12s and 13s, but then quickly spiking back. It wasn't since before Volpocalypse that we actually saw regular occurrences of where the VIX likes to spend most of its time. Low volatility and a market slowly marching higher happens more often than any other period in the market. So we will at some point, and I do not know when, especially given how broken the world seems right now and how broken and nonsensical some policies may seem to us right now, I would imagine at some point we will return to a market that looks lower volatility and maybe even extremely low volatility. We might actually see, you never know, we might actually see a VIX that is averaging 2017 at 11.09. The average for the whole year was 11. We might see that again. I would imagine we will see something closer to the 12s. That's kind of how markets move around. So the most important thing to remember here is that markets change constantly, different market environments. And so us as investors, we have a very long time horizon. We've got 30 plus years. Hopefully, if you started young enough, you've got at least 30 years. I'm sure I'm talking to some people who are in their 60s and 70s, and it doesn't necessarily apply, but maybe you have been going for a long time. The point is that we have a time span of investing that is going to cover all aspects of these market environments, from the lowest of the low vol to what we're seeing now, which is a lot of whipsaw and obviously a massively increased occurrences of big, large VIX spikes, followed immediately almost, it seems, from buy the dip and just crashing down. It's not always going to be the case. So as investors, what we really need to do is we need to make sure that what we're doing and the strategies that we're implementing, it's not important to catch every uptrend. It's not important to win for 30 years straight every year and never have a flat year. It's not the important aspect. The most important aspect, don't do anything that ever fails. You don't want to have something that in certain market environments will fail. And that's getting back to our friend here who asked the question about, you know, buy and hold investing. Buy and hold investing over a 30-year period will probably have three or four that just epically fails. What we need to do is make sure that we have zero failures, none whatsoever. We never take a drawdown that trashes our portfolio for four years and takes us four to five years to get back to that high watermark. We have to make sure that that is the case. And then over 30 years, hopefully you'll have 10 or 15 years where you do really well. You'll have maybe 10 years where it's just kind of eh, average. And maybe you'll have 10 years where it's totally flat. That is absolutely fine. Really good, average, and flat, no failures whatsoever. So whatever we are doing, we have to make sure that if the market remains as it is now, our portfolio doesn't fail. If it goes back to 2017, super low vol, what we're doing is not going to kill us. If we see another volpocalypse, it's not going to crush us. If we see a financial crisis, or maybe worse than the previous one, which I personally believe is going to happen. At some point in the next 10 to 15 years, I think we're going to put the financial crisis to shame. But we have to make sure that we don't fail in that period, and in fact, make money during that period. So these are interesting studies to go through about what market environment we are currently in, but we have to fight the temptation to try to change anything and exactly match up what we're doing to the market and try to make sure that you're, you're winning all the time. The key is to win a majority of the time, do okay, and flat the rest. Never fail. No failures. So I would reassess what you're doing now and ask yourself, pick four sort of hypothetical market environments. Everything from the very best situation you can imagine to the very worst situation and everything in between. Is what you're doing going to navigate successfully and at worst flat through all of those periods? If it is, great. Then we just watch the market unfold and we get the market we have. We can't 
make the market do what we want it to do, unfortunately. I would not choose this current market that we're in. But uh, of course, as investors, that is always the goal, that you just... This is a recurring theme. If you watch my streams, if you follow my work, I am never out there you know, talking about the outlandish wins and talking about big gains and taking on risk. 100% of everything I talk about is risk management and no failures. That's really what we're looking for. I'm personally, on a social perspective, I, I do not want to see a recession at all. It hurts people. It's, it's a struggle for a lot of people. I wish the market never has one again. But from the perspective of my portfolio, I am not only prepared for one, but I will very likely benefit from one. So um, yeah, I would encourage everybody to ask those questions, those tough questions. Well, what happens if I get the worst market? Am I still going to be okay? Um, if the answer is yes, you're doing great, because most people can't answer that honestly and say yes. Most people would say, no, that would be, that'd be rough. I would probably lose, I don't know, 40, 50% in a worst case scenario. That could take many, many years to recover from. So um, that's the lesson. Markets are absolutely more volatile now. Certainly, like I said, not only this decade more than previous decades, but this four years more than previous four years. And there's actually a tweet here that I could show as well. One of the people I follow on Twitter, uh, she posts really good data sometimes, so you can give her a follow if you like. But it says, did you know that you're trading in the S&P 500's third rockiest December since 1987? I did not know that. Thank you, Callie. Uh, yes, the S&P 500 average daily move has been 1.1% this month, the third largest for any in December in 34 years. That's really interesting because a lot of us are feeling that, right? We don't have a number to put to it, but it does feel pretty rocky. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the whipsaw has been off the charts recently. So... Yes, Q4 2018 was a rough one. Obviously, December 2018 was awful. And right in the heart of the dot-com bust, that's bad too. But we're there now. You know, December 2021 is, from a volatility perspective, measured both plus minus, like volatility is. Turns out, if you feel like things are really volatile, you're right. There's a very good reason why you feel that way. So I'm right there with you. I feel it as well. So let's go to the second segment. Let's try to power through this one and, uh, and get to the open Q&A. So hopefully you've still got some coffee left. Like I said on Twitter, coffee and Baileys is also acceptable uh, for everybody. Even the underage ones out there, I'm not encouraging it, but I remember, you know, back in the day, get a little bit of Baileys in the hot chocolate there. It was, I don't know if that's just me or not, but... Uh, good times, Christmas only. So let's talk about my former golf career. All right, so I was a former professional golfer a long time ago. This is another lifetime at this point. I retired from golf in 2005, so certainly not young, a um, lot of gray hair. And I've earned this gray hair. I think a lot of people ask me questions that are outside of investing because I have started businesses. I have, have had successes. I've had a lot of big failures too. And I've definitely earned my gray hair. And people ask me certain questions about it. So I will, um, I'll give you my take and, and a, little, a few of the things that I have learned that might actually be able to help you navigate wherever you're at right now. So the one thing, I said fake it till you make it, but I think a better way for me to present this is what I always tell myself, and I've been telling this since I was just a kid, since I was a 15-year-old kid on the golf course. You want to act like the professional you want to be, not the amateur you currently are. So act, behave, adopt the mannerisms and the habits and routines of the person you want to be, not reflecting the person you are today. And so golf career-wise, for me, this was a very clear lesson that I learned and, and succeeded through, to be honest. And that's why I can share my success because going back in my history, 15 years old. So at that time, my dad was actually a golfer. He was actually a very good golfer, low single-digit handicapper. He won a club championship very good player, but he was a member at a private golf club well out of the city. I was not going to join that club. I wasn't a golfer at the time. I was shooting a, you know, I'd go with him every couple of months. I'd shoot 120 and, and that was it. 
a friend of mine in uh, high school at the time, grade 10, I believe, 15 years old. Yeah, grade 10, maybe grade 9. I was a young, I was like the year younger type of person. Um, maybe grade 10. A friend of mine, his dad started a golf course of his own. It was called Cottonwood. Very nice course, but it was private. But one of the benefits to having a friend that has a dad that started his own golf course is that his dad actually ended up getting 12 of my friends, including me, what's called a sponsored junior membership. So for anybody who doesn't know, to join a private golf club as a junior, you actually have to have parents that are members at the club. They sponsor you, and then you get your junior membership. But he was able to get us junior memberships at Cottonwood, sponsored juniors. So parents would drop us off at the course early in the day, and we'd play golf all day long while the parents are working, and then they'd come pick us up at the end of the day. And I, of course, was the only one of my friends that was even any good at golf, but also progressed to the level of being a professional. And there's a very specific reason why. Because, like I'm trying to get at, in large influence because of my dad at the time, um, where's my thing here? Yeah, because of my dad at the time, he was teaching me certain things along the way, how to act like a good player, how to do the things good players do. So one of the things that's fairly fairly central to what we were doing back then, remember this is 1990, we don't have range finders and automatic things that tell you how far it is. You had to actually practice so that every step you take on the course is exactly one yard, and then you'd have to find the 150 yard marker, and you'd have to actually pace it off. So you pace 40 yards, and you have 110 yards to the flag. I was doing this when I was a terrible golfer. I was doing this when I was shooting 120. And I remember my friends would look at me and they'd laugh and go, what are you doing? You don't know how far 120 is. And you don't know which club in your bag even goes 120. You know, I'm, I'm the butt of every joke, right? But I was doing it because how are you ever going to learn how to hit a shot 120 if you don't first have the data? So I'm the only one of my friends doing this. I'm pacing off yardage. They just eyeball it and pull a club out and smash it into the, into the bunker or something. But I was doing this. And not only calculating proper distances, but let's say you have to calculate the flag as well. Maybe the flag is at the back of the green, so you're going to add 10 yards. Instead of 110, now it's 120. Maybe it's uphill. So the ball, just geometry-wise, is going to fly a little further. So instead of 120, now you've got 115. It's going to stay in the air a little longer. It's going to play as if it's a 115-yard shot. Well, maybe it's into the wind. I'm out there, hack golfer that I am, picking up blades of grass, throwing it in the air and trying to gauge the strength of the wind and the direction of the wind. So maybe you add another five yards. Now it's going to play as if it's 120. But if it's in the morning, I haven't warmed up yet. So the ball isn't going to fly as far. My body isn't as, as warmed up. The temperature's cooler. The ball's going to fly shorter. So add another 10 yards. Now I have a 135-yard shot. And then he can even go further. What kind of lie do I have? If it's a clean lie, it's going to go 135. If there's grass in front of the ball, the grooves of the club is going to stick to the ball and it's going to de it's going to reduce the spin rate and the ball is going to fly farther. So maybe I have to reduce five yards. So that 110 yard, sorry, 110 yard shot that my friends are trying to just eyeball, I know it's actually 130 or whatever it adds up to. Calculating proper yardage. This is what real professionals do. Of course, these days you just have a range finder in your bag, but this was a skill. Another skill, designing practice sessions. You can imagine our parents dump us off at the golf course and all 11 of them just go to the range, pull their driver and start smashing the ball. Well, I'm standing there like, like the hack golfer that I am, can't break 100 yet. And I'm actually doing what my dad told me. I'm stretching for five minutes. I'm starting with my sand wedge. I'm getting my rhythm and my tempo warmed up. I'm doing all these things that professional golfers do. And... Um, you know, it's it's very beneficial to be doing these things. You can learn much, much quicker. I'm designing sessions where I'm actually trying to achieve a goal when I'm out there. Other things, having pre-shot routines. This one's hilarious. When, you know, if you want to be good at something, especially a, a, a physical activity like golf, you, you have a pre-shot routine. Free throw shooters do the same thing. I'm sure quarterbacks do the same thing. Everybody does this if you're good at something. But I shoot 120, so why am I doing it? Well, because you train your brain, you look at the shot, you visualize it, you see the ball flight, you get confidence, you feel the rhythm of your body. I've already done it in my head. So then I just step up and I hit the ball. And of course, my friends are laughing at me in the background like, oh, you're crazy, you're going to snap hook it in the trees. And most of the time I would. 
but this is what allowed me to become good very, very quickly. So for me in my golf career, I'm 15 years old. I just started golf. I can't break 100. That same year at Cottonwood, the end of October, because I'm from Canada, so it snows you know, early October and the course is closed. My second last round, I shot 68 that year. So I broke 100, 90, 80, and 70 all in the same season. And my friends are all still shooting in the 90s. Like they got better, we're all athletic, but they're shooting in the 90s. I'm starting to play tournaments and shooting in the 60s in one year. None of them, I don't think, have ever broken 80, but certainly they were 90s shooters because they're still probably, if I you know, call them up and go on the course, I guarantee you they're not checking their yardage. They don't know how far their six iron goes. They, Not that that's, I mean, if you don't want to be good, then don't do it. Just live your life and drink your beer and have a good round. But for me, I wanted to be good. So what do I do? How do I get good? Well, it's very simple. Act like the professional I want to be now even though I completely suck. And eventually, my learning curve will be rapidly accelerated compared to other people. Now, of course, this applies to everything else. It's not just golf. This is a lesson we can all take, that if you want a better job, and a lot of people out there do, they don't know why they're not getting these promotions and these better jobs. Well, are you sure that from the other person's perspective that you have earned it? Are, do you dress? Do you act? Do you work? Do you talk? Is your schedule? Are you acting like the people who already have that job? Or are you kind of one of those people that, oh, I'll wait till I get it, and then I'll start adopting all of those things? Well, that's not how you get it. In order to get it, you first have to be it. So it's, it's kind of fake it till you make it, but it's more important than that. It's identifying the person you want to be, and then being that person today, whether you actually are or not. You start doing that now. And then, of course, down the road, that's what ends up happening. If you want to be a healthy person, being healthy is not the default position of people. I'm a healthy person, but I do a lot of habits and routines and workouts and tracking calories, and I do all of that stuff. So identify the person you want to be and do it now. I've actually heard people say they're not fit enough to go to the gym. I've actually heard people say this. I mean, I've had conversations with people that, that they think that when I'm fitter, I'll start going to the gym, or when I'm fitter, I'll start walking and running, but you know, I'm, I'm not fit enough to do that now. Or I'll, I'll start eating healthy when I get the results. It, it just, that's just not how it works. That's completely backwards. You do the opposite of that. You identify the healthy person that you are not currently, and you do everything that they're doing. And it won't be more than five or six months before you're that person as well. So um, now we're getting pretty far out of my wheelhouse here, but this is something that I see quite regularly out there as well. And people ask me for advice, so I'm certainly willing to give it. Um, if you do, and I'm not saying you should, but if you do want a wife and kids, you should behave like the family man early on so that you can attract that person and you can get your family and you can start your family and get your kids. You know, there's a lot of people out there. I'm not hacking on anyone, but they're spending a lot of time at the bars, going out drinking, playing video games, doing things that are not going to be, not going to get you to the point where you're going to be. Or of course, from a woman's perspective, do you want a husband? Do you want a family? Well, if that's the case, I have to be careful how I say this on YouTube, but um, let's just say there's some women out there that behave and have some fun and do their things, maybe not fully conducive to attracting a stable family man, if you kind of know what I'm saying. But of course, inevitably, these men and women, they might get to age 35 or 40 and they turn around and say, well, where are all the good people? Well, you know, what happened? I, you know, I'm ready. I'm here. Well, again, it doesn't really work that way. If you want to get the result, you have to first demonstrate the traits. And then over time, the results actually come to you. So to tie this into trading, it's unbelievable how often I get this question. So this is sort of the trading lesson for everybody out there. In some version of this, people ask me all the time, literally every day in my email, somebody will say, I only have $10,000 or I only have 8,000 bucks. What do I do? And inevitably, I think you can imagine the advice I give them. It's along the lines of this. You act like the professional investor you want to be today, and then eventually you will grow into that and you will be that. But for some reason, people think, well, at the beginning of the stages, I might as well just YOLO into Shibu Inu or try to find the next cryptocurrency, or uh, I'll get out of the money calls on AMC and GameStop. That's what it, because it doesn't matter. It's only $10,000. And what I would say is, 
great, do your thing. I mean, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but you're not going to learn anything from that. And it, it's very likely going to fail. For every one person that makes money doing that, there's going to be 10 that just lose their 10 grand. So more than likely what's going to happen if you behave like the amateur you currently are and you just YOLO everything and don't focus on risk management, 10 years from now, you're going to email me and you're going to say, I have $10,000. What do I do? You're going to be this, in the exact same position you are now. You'll ha gain a little momentum. You'll catch a couple wins taking on big risk. And then you'll do something dumb and it'll crash down and you'll go back to the beginning. That's kind of what happens. So my advice to everybody who's trading out there, doesn't matter how much money you have or how little money you have, all of us, from me to all the wealthy people out there, which I'm not, uh, hopefully someday, you know, if I keep on my path, maybe someday, but the whole spectrum from you have 10 grand to you have millions, we should all be investing like the professionals we want to be. Develop those skills, even though you don't have the money Somebody might, you might talk about risk management with your buddies and they'll say, well, I mean, what's this guy doing? He's got six grand in his account. Who cares? Why isn't he buying whatever 0 0.0001 value crypto? Why isn't he doing that? Well, probably because that person's trying to invest as if they have a hundred grand in their account. Do the things that a person with a hundred grand has. They don't YOLO the whole amount. That's their livelihood. I do not take risks with my money because I'm 46 years old and it's taken me a long time to build to this point. I'm not interested in selling naked calls on UVXY. It doesn't do me any good because I have a livelihood to protect. I can't do those stupid things. I can't be YOLOing large amounts of my money. I am acting like the professional I want to be. I see the finish line and then I'm just going to do everything today to get me there. Just like in golf. I'm going to check the yardage. I'm going to throw the grass and people are going to laugh at me, but I'm still going to do that. I'm still going to talk about risk management, even though you only have $12,000. It's the same thing. Eventually you will become that person that you were setting your sights on. So one thing, again, people ask me for advice, so I don't mind taking a few minutes and, and giving it. One of the things that I tell people is you know, obviously the financial industry is a good industry to chase, but if you're looking to change careers, something I often default to is real estate, right? Real estate's a great career because A, you know, it's very easy to get into. There's a very low barrier to entry to get into real estate. You don't have to have some high level degree to do it. Anybody can do it. Uh, B, it makes decent money. But I always tell people that the average person is average for a reason. They're not maximizing their work effort. So Hard work alone gets you into the top 20% of any industry you choose. To get into the top 10, 5, 1%, you have to do things above and beyond. But to get into the top 20, it is simply a function of dedication and work ethic. You'll get to that 20% within a few years. Real estate happens to be a good paying industry where getting into the top 20% is actually quite meaningful. Same with investing. You don't want to pick something that even if you work your butt off and you get into the top 20, it's not an income that you want. Choose something that has that, and real estate's that. And third, it's largely independent and entrepreneurial. Even if you work with a team, even if you have a boss, a lot of your day-to-day -day stuff is going to be you making decisions for yourself, and, and that's always a good thing for me, I, I think, to chase in this world. I think the, the days of chasing a, a, a nine-to-five, not that there's anything wrong with that, as the old Seinfeld episode would say, but uh, yeah, I think entrepreneurial activities are a little bit better use of people's time. But how do you do that? You've never sold a house in your life. I mean, what, what are you going to do? No, Nobody's even approached you to be a real estate agent. How are you going to be a real estate agent? Well, you're going to act like the professional you want to be, not the amateur you currently are. Do you have a license? All those pros that you know, they have a license. Well, go get it. It's cheap. It's quick. You can do it in a month. It's fine. Go get that license. They have websites, don't they? If you go and you find that real estate agent that you want to be, he writes articles, talks about price trends, talks about upcoming communities, gives top five things of how to stage a house correctly to sell it better. They, they do these things. What's stopping you from day one of having your own website? It's what, 40 bucks on Wix.com or whatever it is? Do you have your own website? Why can't you write articles? Why can't you do the research and do those same articles now? Even though you've never sold a house, why can't you do research and write helpful articles for people? You can. Of course you can. Video walkthroughs. I would assume everybody watching this right now is in a home of some sort, right? some box that covers your, your head. You may not, you know, it's house, apartment, whatever it is. 
is there anything saying you can't go get a video camera today, learn how to use that camera, learn how to edit videos, of course, get the wide angle lens that's good for real estate and learn how to do a walkthrough. Why can't you do that now? There's nothing saying you have to sell seven houses before you learn these skills. You do them now, today, before you ever get your first listing. Last thing you want to do is wait for that person that you meet at the golf course to say, hey, you, I like you. Can you sell my house? You say, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I just need to, you know, give me a month. I need to go learn how to do these things. No, you want to be ready on the spot. Yes, I can do that. I've been doing that for ages. Yeah, I can help you. So things like that, getting contacts. It's an entirely contact-driven industry. As a person who grew up on golf courses, I can tell you that the vast majority of the people that I ran into were either asset managers, real estate agents, or in my case, oil and gas people, because I was born in Alberta and it's an oil oil province within Canada. But these three things, realtors, uh, asset managers, half the people I ran into at the golf courses were those. What's to say you can't do that? You don't have to be good. The thing about golf, you don't show up on the first tee and say, I'm a realtor, here's my card, please sell me, let me sell your house. You have four and a half hours of undivided attention from these people. It's a very, very good skill to have. Um, is there anything saying you can't join a golf course now? Learn how to play a little bit so you're not completely embarrassing. Maybe get yourself to the point where you can shoot 100. That's fine. Only 10% of golfers can break 90, so you don't have to be that good. But contacts, start building them. I don't want people to bankrupt themselves, but getting yourself a, a, a flashy car, for example, and joining a, a cars and coffee group, you're going to be rubbing shoulders with entrepreneurs and you know people who you want to get, get close to. Why can't you just do that now? Act like the professional you want to be, not the amateur you currently are. We all want to be Tiger Woods as golfers. We all start as this guy. I've been there. I, I can relate to this guy. I remember I got my three iron stuck in a tree once. I was being an idiot and I threw my three iron and it stayed in the tree. I, another time I threw, again, my three iron. I always throw my three iron because it's the worst club in the bag. I threw my three iron in the lake once. And a uh, little side tangent, at the end of the year, we were all drinking and we actually paid one of my friends to go rent a wetsuit and dive into that lake. And he actually retrieved my three iron for me, but uh, fun times. Anyway, why is this kid gonna be amazing? This is Charlie Woods. This is Tiger Woods' son. Well, obviously, because Ty Charlie Woods, before he could ever break 100, was playing like Tiger Woods. He was adapting all the skills and mannerisms, and I've got something here. Um, they're giving Charlie Woods odds 20 to 1, 10 to 1, that he wins a major by 2040. I think that's a little bit ambitious, personally, but um, yeah, no doubt. Is there any reason why? Like, is there any surprise why? Why is this kid going to be a world beater? Look at who his example is, is in life. Charlie wasn't very good when he started golfing. In fact, you get the point. He was terrible just like the rest of us. We're all terrible when we start something, but the people that get good really fast, they identify where they want to be and they do it today. So that's it. We all want to be, we all have goals to get somewhere, but only a smaller percentage of the population will actually display those traits. And yes, sometimes, as I can speak from personal experience, sometimes embarrassing yourself. You will get people who look at you and go, what are you doing? You know, why are you investing that way? You've got $4,000. What are you doing? I'm throwing grass out there and I'm shooting 110 and I'm sniping everything in the bush. What are you doing? Why are you just, well, you're wasting your time. You're wasting everybody's time. Well, because I know where I'm getting. I know where I'm going to go. And yeah, it applies to absolutely everything in life. So spot the target and live as if. I don't like the fake it till you make it because that implies that you're, you're kind of going to lie or be deceptive of some sort. Um, I'm not implying that at all. I think you should do the hard research and hard work and actually put in the work. But yeah, act like the professional you want to be, not the amateur you currently are. So let's get into the open Q&A. Of course, people can ask me, 
any questions, mostly golf re- or sorry, mostly investing related. But like I said, I've, I mean, this full head of hair, you can't even see it. Sometimes people think, what is he talking about? The entire thing is gray. So that's why you can't really tell. Um, I don't dye my hair. I don't do anything. This is what I got. And the whole thing is gray. So I've earned it. You can ask me unrelated questions if you like. Okay. Bill Ackman. The? No. What is your opinion on buying deep in the money VXX call options? $5 strike when the VIX is low, sub-16 in the market, so you're not paying any extrinsic value for those options. Good. I like that second part that you added. Whenever you're buying options, you are subject to the volatility in that underlying. And of course, we, we actually went into it in a previous live stream where I was demonstrating that buying put options on the VIX after it has spiked up is a losing strategy because you're, you're paying a lot of upfront cost for that increased Vega. So I like the fact that you identified that. Now, when it comes to these trades, I never think that there are good risk rewards. So I'm not saying that this can't make money. Everything that you do in the market could make money. So what, what my job is, as a person who manages their own portfolio, I am only looking for the most efficient ways to make money. I'm not saying that this is worth doing because it will see a positive return. What if I can find a way to use my capital more efficiently and make an even more positive return? That's what I'm doing. So there's no doubt in my mind that you could structure trades that make this work long term. But what I would say is just in general, you probably do want to go closer to the money. There's there's much there's many more ways to structure good trades with good risk reward profiles when you're going a little bit closer to the money. And so in general, I would say yes, if you've got decent timing, I, I see nothing glaring about this, because like you said, you will be buying into this when volatility is low and you'll be holding something that it's not going to crash on you. It's just going to be a slow bleed. But at the same time, personally, I do prefer working much closer to the money whenever possible. So uh, it's about efficiency. And a lot of action is at or near the money. And for the astute options trader who can identify ri- or value and risk, yeah, I would, I would stick closer to that. I, I don't like these things. Plus, you get into the, the, the problem that it actually takes quite a bit to move those contracts and then you're introducing the fact that ticking over an at the money contract, let's say it's just for ease, it's five dollars. Ticking from four ninety five to five happens very quickly. So if you structure a good trade, you can start realizing those gains immediately. But if you start to go further out of the money, yes, your premium's going to be low, or maybe the other side, if depends on what side you're going on. But you have to also be careful that sometimes it takes a little while to tick over. So um, you introduce liquidity issues. You, the, obviously, the extreme example, if you were doing something, what side of the trade did you say you were on? Uh, deep in the money VXX call options. But for example, some people like to buy these nickel and dime contracts. That's fine. I mean, it, if, if it goes in the right direction, maybe it can click up and turn over, but it actually takes quite a bit to turn that gear. So I, I do prefer playing much closer to the money, if that makes sense. I think there's just a whole lot more you could do. You can get in and out of the trades easier. You, It also applies closer to expiration. Like you, If you did the double effect of super long-term, way, way out of the money or st- way in the money that not many people trade, it, it, could just, it could just be inefficient. So, yeah. Okay. I opened a short on the VIXY around Thanksgiving time. Directly short the ETF? I don't personally do that. I think that the risk is too high. I know Brent couldn't make sense of my point of view before, but it's probably because I'm using DeFi platforms. So what it lets me do is unique. I don't see why. I'd, I'd love for you to email and, and expand on this. I'm never one to say, you you know, the edge you think you have isn't an edge. Maybe it is. It just, it's hard to find edges. And when you throw around words like DeFi, it, it, it immediately makes me wonder. Anyway, you've piqued my curiosity for sure. 
definitely playing with fire, but I don't yet have the access to those traditional platforms. Looking to zero in on BTS in 2022 the right way. Just glad my observations were consistent with his vids. So I'm not sure there's much consistency, but you haven't given me much to work with here. So uh, shorting VIXY, no, because like I said before, you want to make sure you're investing so that you never fail ever under any market circumstances. You've already violated that. At some point, there's going to be an insane flash crash. It's just going to happen. Just mark it on the calendar. We don't know what day on the calendar, but we know it's coming. There's going to be a flash crash. There's going to be a cyber attack. There's going to be all manner of terrible things. I don't mean to be a doom and gloom person, but it's going to happen. You're shorting directly an unlimited loss trade. Careful. You violated the first rule of risk management there. And it's not don't talk about risk management. It's actually the opposite of Fight Club. It's actually do talk about it over and over assess excessively. Yeah. Sorry, email me. Let's expand on this. And teach me about what you know about DeFi. Because I am certainly not going to pretend I'm an expert there. I plan to be aggressive and put 40% of my assets in long vol strategy. So the, the most direct long, we have nothing that's long vol, but the one that is most exposed to long vol would be the VB threshold. So are you putting 40% into that when the market will crash? I know you don't recommend such an exposure. Please see the next message. Let's keep going. Um, I do. Oh, you repeated that one. Okay. But as a result on your site for the strategy is plus 100% and there are no major whipsaws in your graphs when long vol. When long vol is used in crashes like 08, 2020. Can you explain why it is so risky? Okay, so it's, it's similar to what I said before, that you're not actually going to, you may not actually get caught with massive calamitous trouble when you're in the long vol trade, as, as long as you choose them correctly. The problem is the slow bleed. Well, there's two problems. The slow bleed, which happens because these are insurance products. So whenever you're long vol in any form, whether that is volatility ETPs, VIX futures, VIX options, S&P 500 put options, whatever you're doing that is long vol, that is going to behave like an insurance product and it, it will decay long term. It has to. The markets break if you don't. Everybody would go out and buy unlimited levels of insurance and their portfolio would be 100% protected. So insurance by very mathematical design is going to cost you money. So we can only hold it during the most strategically advantaged times. But the problem with long vol is that the vast majority of the time it is a decaying asset. So if you're going to increase your either exposure to a long vol strategy, which in itself will carry drawdowns, or you're going to increase the window that you're, you're willing to hold long volatility, either one of those is introducing risk. Not necessarily risk like you're going to get crushed like a like a flash crash will crush the short vol guy, the long vol people can, can sort of manage it more of a slow bleed. But it is a problem, and you're going to probably lose more than it's worth if you expand that window too much. So that's why I only use a very small sliver of long volatility. Only during the most extreme markets, when it's very clear things are melting down and all the volatility metrics are already elevated, at that point, you've got the VIX futures backwards, you've got negative roll yield in the VIX curve. At that point, it can make a little bit of sense to start dipping a toe in the long vol pool. If you're going to be the type of person that is essentially a contrarian, you're going to buy those positions in fairly heavy allocation and sit and wait. Well, there's no doubt that crash is coming. So at some point, you're going to make money. But the money you lose waiting for it to happen might actually eclipse the money you eventually make when it does happen. And that's the experience of a lot of these long vol traders and a lot of these long vol funds. You will see an insane amount of marketing from these long vol guys, these tail risk guys, crazy levels of marketing during crashes. And then sometimes they have to go years by just saying, eventually, you'll see, you'll see. That's the kind of pattern that it does. So I don't like to introduce that. I only, you know, hit it when it makes sense and save your money when it doesn't. So I would say a 40% allocation to anything that includes volatility is aggressive. You're introducing drawdowns and opening up the long vol window where you're kind of playing the contrarian and you're saying you're willing to wait for this event to happen. 
be careful what you wish for, because eventually it will happen. But at that point, you might be down so much money that it would take Volpocalypse just to get you back to break even. So you want to be very, very careful about long vol. And then the second thing that I hinted on, the second problem beyond the slow bleed is what I call the dreaded give back. The dreaded give back happens because when you're right in a long vol trade, it means volatility is spiking and you're making money and you're high-fiving and you go online and you're the smart one in the room and everybody's panicking and you're making money and it's all great. But you have to know that at some point, the market's probably going to turn on a dime. It's probably going to be some news event, some stimulus package, just pure exhaustion of selling. Like the more people that buy the long vol, the less people need their hedging. Eventually, it's going to turn the other way. The same signals that got you into the long vol trade are the same ones that are going to keep you there because long vol can be sticky. Those metrics can stay elevated long after the market has bounced. So your, your profit curve sometimes looks like a really steep, I'm an amazing trader, and then the dreaded give back on the other side where you don't know when to get out of that trade. That's the danger in the long vol trade. Getting in should be used very sparingly. Getting out, probably quite liberally, you know, Take your money, don't be too greedy, don't, don't hang in there for too long because in many cases you can end up giving most or even all of your profit back. If you look at some of these, you know, the most famous tail risk funds out there, not only are their absolute numbers negative long term, that's very common, but you'll often see that it doesn't actually take very long for them to give everything back. Now, of course, there's mathematical reasons why some of them still think it's beneficial to do. I'm not necessarily down on that type of tail risk strategy, introducing a small amount of tail risk is mathematically going to probably improve the performance of a portfolio. But my point being that you're an individual and you're going to have to know when to get in and when to get out. So I would be very conservative getting in and quite liberal and quick to take profit when you're getting out is just in general. But I can't tell you what to do. 40% is, is more than I do. And all I can ever be responsible for when anything that I do in my life are things that I actually do with my money. You will never hear me say anything that my money isn't actually in. And my money's not in that at that allocation. So I'm not actually going to be able to be okay with you doing that. You can, you're a free individual. I would not support that decision. I think it's, I think it's too much. I don't know where this is coming from. Buy and hold TQQ. Ugh. Can you imagine the drawdown of a buy and hold TQQ? I haven't looked at it, but remember the NASDAQ itself drew down 78% in the dot-com bust. And I would imagine in the future, we're going to see another one of those. These tech, tech is, is so overvalued right now. Now, overvalued doesn't mean a crash is imminent. It could take years before this bubble pops, but it, it is a bubble. And can you imagine three times leverage queues? Boy, that is an ulcer waiting to happen. Morning, Merry Christmas to Vanessa there. If you could, would you work out your metrics at the end of the day or is the last hour of market close also too noisy? So good question. The first hour or so, I don't look at that data because it is choppy and you get a lot of reversals early on. We'll leave that first hour to the day traders out there. I know they love the action, They, you know, getting those big moves and reversals. So I start collecting my data about an hour, hour and 15 minutes after markets open. And then I give people the signals that are active the entire day because intraday is a, is a random walk anyway in these markets. I, ca I can't know that at two o'clock something's gonna happen. It's just, you cannot predict things on, on an intraday basis. Of course, don't at me in the comment section if you're a day trader and you think it's the way to go. I just don't think there's any edge in narrowing it down to minutes and, and hours. I think one day time schedule, I'll check the metrics tomorrow and, and make choices then. But should I do it the last hour? Yeah, I have no problem with the last hour as far as Whipsaw. You do see what I would s suspect. I don't have any data to, hard data to support this. So I wanna be careful when I say this, it is an opinion. But I think the last hour might also be a little bit more choppy than the middle section. So I guess in a perfect world, you could say that anything from an hour and a half after markets open to an hour before markets close will probably be the most stable. 
I mean, we're t- we're splitting hairs here. It's not like the midday can't also be whipsaw, but on balance of probabilities, I would say you're looking at midday as the most stable. But my strategies would work virtually the same. I assume on a long term, you know, high number of occurrences basis, just the same. If I took my metrics at eleven or two thirty end of day. I can also show that because we have end of day. I can't show intraday. I have no data that supports intraday values. I don't know what the VIX 9D was at 11.15 on, you know, the in 2007. I have no idea. But we do know end of day. So I could run those numbers and I could just cross-reference it with the live trades that I've sent out for 10 years. I could do that. Um, I did that about five years ago. There was no difference. So be interesting to update it. But I always assume that on an intraday basis, it is a random walk. So there's no benefit for me trying to narrow down those increments. It's just today's trade is based on today's market and that might change in an hour. It might, but I don't go in there and change my position because that might reverse an hour later. We see that all the time in the markets. So I just go once per day and I, I get what I get. It is what it is. That is the best time frame in my opinion. And so anytime after an hour and 15, the reason I start doing it then, I could do it at 2.30, that's fine. But I do have a community of people who are waiting to take their trades. So since it doesn't affect performance at all, why not give them a, a larger window to execute those trades? I'm always last in line. I give the signals at you know 11 a.m. and I don't actually take them until the end of day. So I'm definitely the last in the string of people who take my trades, but it's all kind of the same. It all blends in. Law of large numbers. The more frequency you get, half the time it'll be beneficial, half the time it'll hurt you. Long run, it's the same thing. I'm not up. December was a tough month, I assume. Are you, What are you up in your portfolio? I don't run the numbers until about maybe 10 or 12 days into the next month because I'm always comparing to benchmarks, hedge fund indexes and whatnot. So I don't even compile. They're always late to release their results. I could do mine on the first of the next month, but I just do it once. So I just wait about 12, 14 days. Um, I don't know, down a few percent. Like we, like we talked about before, December itself was a massive whipsaw month. So my trading is more trend following on both sides. I can benefit equally from trends on either side. I can make a killing if tra- if markets are super cooperative. And I can also make arguably even more if markets crash and there's an extended recession. What chops me up is the in-between, right? You, you can't have everything, right? You have to make a choice. Do I want to do really well in choppy markets? Well, in that case, you want to just super heavy allocate to things like iron condors and calendars and stuff like that, really play with it at the money premiums, which I do in my options trading, but it's a smaller portion of what I do. I have chosen that the larger portion of my net worth will be dedicated to things that profit in more trend following environments. So I am looking for trends that last longer than a few days. Week plus would be great in either direction. I don't care if it's a crash or an up, but I do need that trend to be something identifiable that the volatility metrics can tell me this is more than likely the market we are in. When you're chopping up and up to down one and a half, up to like the choppiest month since, you know, top four in the last 30 years. Yeah, it's just, there's a lot of whipsaw where I get into one position, the market reverses the next day. I'm in the wrong one. So I switch to the other one. You lose a little bit there on the tri- on the crossover. Very frustrating, but uh, it's totally part of the system that I have put together. And that's what my money's in. It's It's, in my opinion, that is the best way to invest. In a world where you can't win in all environments, you have to choose on balance of probabilities, where is the most benefit of of where I'm going to invest? And for me, that is, I don't know if you'd call it barbell trend following, but, you know, on either side of the equation and just, you know, flat in the middle. So yeah, flat performance during choppy markets is something that I've had to accept in order to get the really good performance when the market is either stable or crashing. Unfortunately, in this world, at least for me, I have not found the holy grail of investing where you can just make money all the time. I have not found it. I'll keep looking. I'll share my results if I find it, but I am yet to find that holy grail. 
Okay, George. How long would you recommend to just follow the trades in a paper account before trading with actual assets? So this is a really good question. And it's, it's made a lot more complicated just given the nature of this investing world that we are in, where, I mean, in honestly, generally speaking, it would be better for the longer, the better, right? Because I'm a stranger, right? I've been posting performance every month for 10 years public, actually about 12, but my old websites are not my current website, but I've been posting all that performance but I'm a stranger and I'm online and I'm unregulated. So, I mean, yes, on the one hand, I could say, well, certainly at some point in the last 10 years, one of my subscribers, we've got subscribers from over 65 countries now, you'd think one person at some point in the last 10 years would have mentioned that, hey, I didn't quite get what you put on the website. So the fact that I've literally have zero haters, I've never blocked anyone, I've got no, nothing contested whatsoever, not that that's a track record per se. It's not an audit from Deloitte or anything, but you know, at some point you'd think that my business would delve into where all those other actual frauds delve into. You notice that they're always at odds with each other. There's always blocking and comment sections and all oh, this person's, you know, find one person in the last decade that said anything about me. Um, so on the one hand, I can say you're in good hands that way. But the other hand, like I was getting at, I'm a stranger. So wouldn't be a bad idea for you to trade in a paper account, confirm a few of the months of the numbers that I've posted, and when you're ready to dive in, you can do that. And the reason why this is so complicated is because on the other side of it, there's not much you can do there either because I'm an unregulated person that's just trading my own money and sharing it with the public and people follow me because they trust me. Well, if you wanted to get out of that and go to the regulated side of things, nearly no asset managers post performance ever. So you can't know anything about their results. You see all these people online that you follow and you think, wow, that's a volatility expert. They manage a fund. They're a hedge fund manager. That means nothing in the context of a world where we know that 85% of managers underperform their benchmark. When you see someone on Twitter that sounds like they know what they're talking about, you have to remember that if we are going to be subject to statistics and probabilities, and that's how we become good traders, by respecting statistics. Well, statistically speaking, that person you're following is among the 85%, not the 15. And unless they can prove otherwise, the only way you're ever going to know whether your asset manager is good or not, and the odds are terrible that they're good, just statistically, they might be good, but there's all kinds of industry reasons why they might be underperforming. The odds are very good you're going to not be happy. The only way you can ever actually do that is to put your money at risk. So at least for me, in, in the way that I've structured my business, you could look at the trades and you could track it in a model portfolio until you're comfortable that I am an honest person and I'm reporting things accurately. You can't do that with a, with a fund out there. You can't tell the hedge fund manager, look, I, I like you, I trust you, but can you just shoot me three months of trades and I'm just going to track it in a paper account? You, you can't do that. You are subject to an industry where most of them won't do well for you and nearly none of them post performance. Well, now what does the average person do out there? They're wary of people like me because it is a absolute minefield out there of all the frauds online. So they're worried about people like me who post results on a website, but those results could be anything. You won't know until you follow. But you also can't go the other way either because more than likely you're going to be very disappointed in your asset manager or your financial advisor. You're just going to, well, who can't just go online and find a pie chart of buy and hold and do that and save the fees, right? So I feel you. I this is a big problem in this world. And it's something that I give thought to. That's why I am so diligent reporting results accurately. And that's why I'm so public with everything I do. I want to make sure that, I mean, I would challenge anybody out there to speak on camera for as many hundreds and maybe thousands of hours as I have and still have people think that I'm not contradicting myself and tripping myself up. Wait a second, three months ago, you said this, and now you're saying this. Um, I'm on camera a lot. I write a lot. I've got uh, you know, over a thousand articles. I've been doing this for, like I said in the intro, since I retired from golf in 2005. 
Um, I do my very, very best to be as transparent as humanly possible and make sure that everybody who follows me understands that there's no negativity, you know, being spoken. At worst, you might see people negative because maybe just a knee-jerk reaction, they'll throw me in the same pool as all the other frauds out there for lack of a, I mean, it's an accurate word. I don't mean to, you know, throw dispersions at anybody, but yeah. Maybe they throw me in the same pool and they say, oh, subscription service, this guy, you know. But I go as far as I possibly can to give you confidence. But I would say at the end of the day, I absolutely know what you're talking about here. And it is a big problem that all of everybody out there who's not going to manage their money themselves, and let's face it, it's really, really hard to make a rate of return. Most people in this world have jobs and hobbies and families, and they just don't have 10 hours a day like I do to work on my investments. You're going to need help. Well, where do you get that help? You've got all manner of, of dishonest people making exorbitant claims of performance that, boy, if you don't know those are lies, I don't, I don't know how to help you beyond just reiterating over and over again that, look, these social media is a, a minefield. But then again, I'd like to be able to point you in the direction of some people in the industry who are regulated and who can act as a custodian for your money to make it easier for you. You know, you don't have to take the trades yourself. I got, you know, these five people, they, but nobody posts post performance. 85% of them underperform their benchmark. It, it's just, I don't know. I'm sorry my thoughts are scattered on this. I feel your pain, but I'd say in general, it wouldn't be a bad idea for anybody out there to implement the good old paper trading account. It's it's there for you. Pretty much every brokerage account you open, it's going to be available to you. If you don't trust, goes far beyond me. If you don't trust what you're following, confirm first. I mean that that would be and if they don't provide you a method of confirming first, then that's fine. They they're entitled to do that. But it is a deal breaker. If the person that you're potentially going to put your net worth and your life savings and your whole livelihood that's meant to take care of your family, if there's no way to test beforehand, to test drive it, you know, kick the tires a little bit, that's fine. I'm not calling them a fraud. It's fine if they don't provide that. Maybe they can't provide that. It's fine. But it is a deal breaker on your end. If you can't test it before putting your money at risk, in this day and age, in 2021, you can't invest. You can't invest in somebody who can't give you the signals that you can follow in a paper account for a few months and confirm that everything kind of makes sense. And how's this going to feel, right? Am I going to join this thing and I'm going to get my money in there? And you're not going to really know. You're never going to know until you see your dollar value go up or down. And statistically, it's going to go the other way. We just, we just know that. So yeah. The fact that you're asking this question makes me very happy. I think this is a very responsible thing to ask, and it's something that I wish people took more seriously, given the just the sheer numbers of, of ways you could get sidetracked in this world, in the investing world. Yeah. Give it a couple months. Absolutely. One of the reasons I give the free trial is just this. I don't want people paying me anything before they know what they're getting into. I want you to see several, many emails trades happening before you commit to anything. I mean, it's just, I wouldn't have it any other way. Just, why would I expect somebody to just trust some random person? I'm trustworthy. I'm very honest. I pride myself on it. I'm, I'm the type of person, I have golf tournaments where I, I called myself on penalties and disqualified myself, and I'd actually convinced the marshal that I did something wrong because nobody saw. But it's a gentleman's game, and when you break the rules, inadvertently, I wasn't cheating, I just... I grounded my club in a bunker and I thought that bunker was a waste bunker, but it turned out, I found out a couple holes later that that was an actual sand trap and two stroke penalty. I didn't fix the problem ahead of time. Got to call myself. I'm out. That cost me money. It's a professional tournament. I, I, it was on Saturday. I was in the money. Um, so I'm very honest, but I don't get even the slightest bit offended when people doubt what I'm posting. Not at all. That's, the default position you should have. You should doubt everything you see online these days. So paper trade. Take a lesson from our buddy George here. Um, nothing wrong with confirming before committing, basically. Yeah, good question.
I hope that I'm doing this for many, many years to come. And I hope that at no time in my career does any drama or accusations or any of that stuff happen. It just... There's, there's no better way to be happy in life than being genuine and um, telling the truth, or at least never say anything you don't 100% believe. So I will just keep saying that over and over in my live streams for many, many years to come. If volatility spikes more often in the last four years, does it mean there is a higher profit from buying the reversion in the last four years? Excellent question. I actually have planned to do this on a live stream. So the thing that you have to remember is that it's both sides of it. This is very interesting. I'll probably give you a very bad answer today, but I will put some thought into answering this with some actual math to back it up. The one thing you have to remember is losses are more costly than gains are beneficial. So what we mean by that is if you have a year, start with 10 grand and you make 50% this year, you're at $15,000. Next year, you lose 50%. You're not back to 10,000. You lose 50%. You're down to $7,500. You're down 25%. That's because the losses mathematically, geometrically compounded, are going to be more costly to you than the gains are beneficial. So your question is true on half of it. It's true that you can profit more on the reversion down. Your wins in this type of whipsaw environment, if you are a reckless trader, if you're safe like me, you're probably going to get chopped up. There's going to be too much whipsaw to really capitalize on it. So that's why I'm in a position where this is actually one of my worst investing years I've ever had. In 17 years, I've never had a losing year, but this is one of those years where just for the way that I invest specifically, it has chopped me up quite a bit. So I'm not going to be able to do this, but I'm saying for you, if you are a sort of the more risky, sort of reckless type, absolutely true. That reversion, that vol crush can actually end up making you more money. But you have to remember the other side is also true. The losses are also amplified as well. So when you amplify gains and losses, and let's assume you don't have a functional crystal ball, so you're going to have an equal number of both. If it's a calm, stable market, you're going to have a certain percentage of good and bad. In a super whipsaw market, you're going to have a same percentage of good and bad. That percentage, your actual performance will not be the same in those two environments. You would be better off in the stable one. Because while it's true that you won't make quite as much when the vol crushes, it's also true that you won't lose as much when it rises. And losses hurt you more than the gains help you. So in this type of environment, I'm going to hack on social media a lot today. I don't mean to do that in every stream, but it's true. In this type of environment, performance-wise should be lower. Mathematically, it will be lower because while it's true the gains have been, they've been there for the taking, the losses are also there. We've seen five. What did I show? Um, I have it highlighted wrong here. Um, these are all in blue, so give me a second to sort of parse through this. But if you notice how many of these happened in 2021, I think just, I don't want to stall here, I think five of them, five of the largest VXX spikes in history happened this year, and every one of them happened when the VIX futures were above the long-term average, meaning significant contango, stable markets, no reason not to be short vol, five times this year, out of nowhere, vol spikes. This is what we're talking about. So yes, it's true. The reversion on the other side is going to be beneficial if you catch it, but you also caught this one and that's going to hurt more than the reversion helps you on the other side. So what you'll see is a lot on social media in years like this, where there's clearly opportunities to make money for anybody who's a short vol trader. They, they can ident see that period. I was short vol and I got the vol crush and look at that glorious vol crush. Look at how much money I made. Well, because everybody on social media doesn't tell you the bad periods, they don't highlight the negative trades, they don't tell you how much money they lost on all five of those VXX spikes that happened when the VIX futures were at 8 or 12% contango the day before. If you skip that, it can give people the impression that there's a lot of people who are making a killing shorting ball this year. If you only highlight the reversion and you don't highlight the losses, yeah, this is the environment you want. You want that big vol crush. You know, I want a short vol and I want it to just epic vol crush. Well, to get the epic vol crush, 
weren't you also short ball? Didn't you also just take a massive outsized loss to get to that reversion? So that's the problem, is that it's kind of true, but it's not the environment you want. Trust me, you will make more money as a short vol trader in stable markets. Even though the actual vol crush, if you measured it, might be a lot less, you'll get hit less too. So you, will, you should always default, and I don't mean to say the right way or the correct way, there's all kinds of ways. You, my way is not the only way to invest. Sometimes when you're speaking just casually, you say things. I don't mean the right way. But when you're trading in a responsible way, you should probably want markets to be more stable. That would be my impression, that you don't want periods of repetitive, massive vol crush. It's hard to trade that environment. I get chopped up, but even risky traders that have to tell about the bad days, not the Twitter traders that don't ever mention taking losses. The real people that have to post real performance, not doing so well this year. It's been a rough one. On Twitter, everybody's a millionaire this year. Funny how that works. <clears throat> I've heard that institutions running 60-40 are transitioning to equities with long vol overlays six months out, which is bidding up forward term structure. Interesting theory. Any ramifications from this systematic buying? None that we can take into account because you, you cannot quantify what you said. I think it's interesting and I, I would call that reckless, but I wouldn't put it past anybody doing that. Um, yeah. If you're talking about the idea that bonds are no longer a safety position, so the old 60-40 doesn't make much sense anymore, and so you could actually replace bond portion, which is supposed to be the negatively correlated to equities portion of a portfolio, supposed to save you and, and reduce drawdowns during really bad periods. If that's broken, which mathematically it kind of is, I mean, the 35-year bull market in bonds is, is mathematically speaking, this is not an opinion, it's certainly running on fumes, if not all but over, because of course the inverse relationship with interest rates that are scraping the bottom. So if you wanted to replace that position with something that is a truly good inverse correlation to the equity market, which is long volatility, it would make sense to do that. Now you wouldn't do it to 60-40 because long vol is, there's a lot of convexity there and there's a lot of drag because it's an insurance product. So, I mean, you might be looking at a, you know, I don't know, way, way higher percentage. I don't even want to say because people might get the impression it was a recommendation, but yeah, you could kind of do that. As to your question about whether that is actually bidding things up, I would say likely no, because there, you always have to assume that for everybody that thinks one thing is going to happen, there's just an equal number of people that think the other thing is going to happen. The opposite of that is going to happen. So while there's certainly you could identify certain funds that might be buying VIX futures in additional levels now compared to the past... I guarantee you, you could find just as many that are going the other way. I think it would be a dangerous assumption to assume that it's more one-sided than 50-50. So I wouldn't take anything into account. Plus, we can point to previous periods where it is sort of similar to now, where volatility was significantly elevated, even though equity markets were high. I don't think this is abnormal. It's just, it's just abnormal in the context of the last 12 years. It's not abnormal in a 40 or 100-year context if we had that. Unfortunately, we don't have vol metrics that go back very far, but I don't think this market is abnormal. It's just abnormal given that, what, 80% of us weren't even trading back in 2005? You know, what percentage of people even, even traded in 1997 when the VIX was at 25 and the markets were up 30%? What percentage of us were even there? I don't know. I wasn't. I was still golfing and, you know betting the members at my golf course so I could make some money and not get a real job. Okay. We've been going for too long already, so I should cut it and do a stream next week from Panama as well. But let's try to do a few more since I'm, I'm getting on a plane. I got to pack up all the camera gear. So this will be the last one for about a week. Well, maybe I'll, I'll do one next Tuesday or something. I don't know. Before New Year's, I'll try to get one. All right. So how would you 
recommend hedging against overnight volatility spikes on your aggressive portfolio. Also, what portfolio of yours offers the most protection against these spikes? Okay, so I don't hedge my trend following strategies at all. There are no, we hold short vol plus we have an external hedge. There is no hedge in that respect. My protection and my drawdown management happens because of the overall diversification of the portfolio and the fact that most of the time they're not all completely aligned and the fact that I can switch positions in a single day. Now, if there was a 5% limit down S&P day that led to a 25% spike in the VXX, I would wake up the next day and not be very happy about that. So I would lose whatever I lose. 5% of my equities, if I'm leveraged, maybe 10, and then short vol. Mine are always smaller allocations, so it wouldn't totally crush me, but it would it would hurt. You know, it's not out of the question that my leveraged portfolio could lose 10% in a day. It's not out of the question. But the thing that I'm, I've been very good at is I have the volatility metrics sort of all calibrated so that I'm for sure going to be in safety the next day if that were to happen. So all of us, 100% of investors are subject to not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. 100% of us. So you just have to determine, are you going to be the person that holds the negative returning hedge constantly, or are you going to be the person that reacts to the market after it happens? And for me, be, what I do is I start with a portfolio with no leverage and lowest drawdowns I can possibly produce. That would be the total portfolio solution. So that answers one of your questions. The basic unleveraged total portfolio solution is max drawdown in the last 10 years at 8% and only a handful greater than five. So my drawdowns are three or four or in some cases, seven or eight times lower than your typical asset manager. So I start with that. And then I add leverage if I want to be aggressive and I find ways to short vol in higher allocations and open up the window and those thresholds so I can be more active. But I always start with the safety and I don't hedge that portfolio. So I'm on the other side. I'm a reactionary. I got to make sure that I have a mechanism to get out tomorrow if I need to, but I'm not actually going to hold those negatively correlated hedges that in the long run lose money. You have to know that holding constant rolling hedges reduces your, your profit. It's an anchor on the portfolio. It, and again, it has to be because insurance has to cost money. You can't insure your house for free. It, it's going to cost you money. And most likely, the fire that's going to make it all pay for itself is probably not going to even happen to you. You might get a little kitchen fire, but the, the whole house burning down is probably not going to happen to you statistically. So you're going to be paying that insurance forever and it's never really going to pay off. That's kind of what long vol is. That's what hedging is. It's hedging against just the worst and it's going to cost you money. And probably, you'd probably just be better off to take your licks for one single day and then get out of the trades and get to safety. So that if it is the start of a 50% drawdown in the market, if it's just you know, September 15th, 2008 or something, you're not still in those trades into October or into December or just buy and hold the whole thing. I'm, I'm out the next day. So I am fully conscious of the fact that I might take a single day loss that happens out of nowhere. I have just gauged that there's no way I'm going to reduce my long-term performance by rolling hedges that will mathematically not pay off for me. So that's my rant on how I invest. But I always am careful to say there are many more ways than just mine to, to do well. So let me try to do something better. So what you'd probably be looking at is you'd want to have convexity with your hedging. So you're looking at things that will make an outsized return if you get that big crushing period. So you'd, you'd be looking at small positions in UVXY or, you know, at or out of the money calls on VIX or VIX futures or, you know, stuff like that. Uh, out of the money puts on the S&P 500. I don't know. 
I was going to try to tell you, you know, which one I, I don't like any of them. I just don't, um, just don't like the, the idea of constant rolling hedging. One thing that I would think you might want to look into, they're not hedges, but positions that can make money if markets crash, just not crash epically. So an example would be a, a rolling five to 10% out of the money long put butterfly on the S&P 500, something like that, where if you open it today, the way that, or a calendar, the way that an out of the money put calendar works is that wing will probably cover, because it's a fairly efficient market, it'll probably be fairly close to the current price. So as long as your trade, as long as the S&P 500 stays flat, you've spent money on something that will profit if the markets go down, but you won't necessarily lose the money if they just stay flat. If it goes up, you're going to lose your money. You're going to lose that put calendar. It's going to cost you money. But if the market goes down 5 or 10%, that calendar can actually make money for you, right? Especially since it does act, behave more or less as a long volatility position. So you can actually do pretty well on those. Um, broken wing butterflies on volatility ETPs, something that I do a lot. And, you know, basically one of the more well-known things that I do that very few other people even ever talk about. I've never seen anybody, you know, make videos or anything uh, out of, you know, out of the money, broken wing butterflies on vol ETPs. These are things that they may not cost you money all the time, which is good. But the problem is that if you get one truly epic crash, it might blow right past that because it's not entirely a convex hedge. I'd start looking into more stuff like that. And again, I'm only speaking from personal experience. My money is not in any rolling straight up hedging. My money does park sometimes in trades that can profit off smaller pullbacks. I like those. Because again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift out into safety tomorrow. So if you're saying I'm holding the SVXY, I'm short vol and I'm going to hedge it. Do I sell my hedge the next day as well? Because the next day, if it spikes, I'm out of that trade. So I don't need the hedge either. So constantly buying and selling volatility, I'm short and then I'm offset long. What's the point of that? Why not just reduce the exposure of the original trade? Why would you hold long, short vol and long vol? Everything is short vol in the market. Almost everything. Everything is a quasi short vol. If you're long equities, you're short vol. So if you're holding short vol and long vol at the same time, I would say, why not just reduce the original exposure? Save yourself the headache. Why buy two opposing assets that, you know, one of them's going to bleed money and they're basically mathematically inversely correlated to one another. I, I just don't do it. I don't know. I wish I could give you a better answer. I just don't like it. Don't see the point. Okay. Should probably wrap it up. Let me see if I can just, if, if one just jumps out and screams at me. That screaming. <laughs> Is averaging down on long SVXY shares a good strategy to fade VIX spikes? Well, remember it dropped 96% in a single day. Now, in fairness, that was more of a liquidity issue in the VIX futures, not so much a volatility event per se. The old SVXY was a one times inverse product and it dropped roughly 35% during regular market hours on February 5th, but then it dropped from 35% down to the full 96 by the end of the aftermarket rebalancing. So that's not necessarily a problem of the volatility spike that caught everybody off guard, but let's just assume that there will at some point on a long enough time horizon, there will be one. Averaging down on something that can crash that far? No. I mean, of course it's better than nothing. Obviously, trying to reduce your cost basis, if you have a long enough time horizon, you might end up with something that's close to break even. But I would suggest just trying to have as many indicators as possible to get you filtering out as many of the bad trades as possible. And in no form of buy and hold, in my opinion, is ever a good idea. Averaging down is buy and hold. It's just a slightly better version of buy and hold. 
I don't support that. But uh, honestly, that could take you a very, very long time to break even if you're averaging down. So, yeah, there's far more efficient ways. This gets back to the point I made earlier about if you take a spectrum of, say, five investing methods to short ball, five different ways to go about it, probably if you're good at shorting vol and gathering and analyzing data, you could probably make all five of them work for you. You're gonna make profit in all of them. The person who sells naked UVXY calls, I've never said that can't make money. All I say is there's many better ways to do it, so don't do that. That's the dumb way to do it. But even the dumb way, if you're good at the dumb way, you could still make money doing the bad way of trading. It's just that what we should focus on as investors is the most efficient, the most safe, the best long-term rate of return we can get. And that comes in this respect by not selling UVXY naked calls. Might make money, maybe, but you'd make more money doing something better. This strategy, averaging down on SVXY, and when it spikes up, you buy more. First of all, buy more with what? Where's the money coming from? Did you take a second mortgage on your home? This is the idea that people think, oh, buy the dip, just buy the dip. Cool, with what? Aren't you already allocated? What are you buying the dip with? Do you just find a duffel bag full of money and you're just gonna buy the dip? You were already in the trade. There's no money to buy the dip. You just stay in the dip and hopefully the dip recovers, but there's no buy the dip. And if there is, that's an inefficient use of capital. If you've got a duffel bag full of money on the side ready to buy the dip, then you're not utilizing your capital well, are you? You want to get the most amount of money allocated to trades in the safest possible way to maximize your performance. Taking a hundred grand and only allocating 20% of it and then having additional layers to buy the dip, it's just a terribly inefficient way to trade. I'm not saying it can't make money. Maybe it could long-term if you have a long enough time horizon. But trust me, there are far more efficient ways to use your capital than that. You shouldn't be able to buy the dip. I should do a video on that. This whole buy the dip idea. If you have capital ready to buy the dip, you're probably not maximizing your capital efficiency. Buy the dip with what? My money's already allocated. Like I don't have any more, unless you're, unless you're telling me to use my margin and then that's a different story entirely. But this account is allocated. This is what it is. $266,000 of actual cash of course, brokerages will give you more than this, but th my actual cash is in. There is no buy the dip. There's either keep the dip and hope it comes back or get out and try something else. I suppose, yes, you could make a case that I could use all that margin. But again, I would say there's more efficient ways to use that available margin than just saying, okay, well, I am short vol right now. I am in the SVXY. I got no money to average down. It's all in. 10% of my portfolio is long SVXY right now. That's it. There's not 10% more sitting on the sidelines waiting to buy the dip. All 10 is in. So, yeah. Don't like the average down stuff. I don't, and I don't, I certainly, obviously, you, it's nothing to do with you. I'm not picking on you, but the whole buy the dip thing just occurred to me. It, it triggers me. Everybody loves to buy the dip, but I'm just always so ultra curious as to where this extra money is coming from to buy the dip. Um, okay, so there's a million more questions. I'm going to take a bunch of screenshots here, so bear with me. And Merry Christmas to everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in, asking awesome questions. We didn't get to hardly any of them, so I am going to do one next week. I'm uh, ducking out to Panama and I'll be there on the 26th, probably prepare something for a couple of days. So roughly uh, the 28th or 29th, I don't know, what is that next Wednesday? Come back, ask your questions next Wednesday, but right now go enjoy Christmas with the family. And um, yeah, one more week of trading and then a whole new year. So thanks everybody, Merry Christmas.